Well, what I'd like to do today is to talk about research integrity and the impact that that has in formulating healthcare policy. We've heard a lot about what to do in healthcare and what needs to be done, but many times that's based upon research. And the research has to be right, it has to be correct, and it has to be reliable. Now, many would think that this isn't a big problem, but unfortunately, the reverse is often true. Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet, has stated, the case against, scientific sci or the case against science is straightforward. Much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, may simply be untrue. Similar comments have been made uh, regarding uh, what the FDA has found, that the FDA has found uh, significant departures from good clinical practice. Those findings are seldom reflected in the peer-reviewed literature, even where there is evidence of data fabrication or other forms of research misconduct. So what I would like to do is, is to give you an example and to talk about that and to look at some of the ways that research integrity questions can arise. Now again, this is all from my perspective, and, and uh, a lot of these are my opinions, and certainly some of the areas, such as spin, is kind of in the eye of the beholder. But one of the themes that we've heard about have been infectious diseases, and certainly MRSA is one of the most common pathogens and one of the most studied pathogens that, uh, that we've had here today in the United States, and, and it is a huge problem. In 2013, the Department of Health and Human Services set multiple targets for infectious disease. I believe there were five of them. Unfortunately, we only met one of the targets. Uh, two targets for MRSA, uh, invasive MRSA, our goal is a 50% reduction. We achieved a 36% reduction. For facility onset MRSA or bloodstream infections, our goal was a 25% reduction. We only, received, uh, we only achieved a 13% reduction. Now this is a, a graph which shows the results of bloodstream infections, hospital-acquired bloodstream infections in the United States. The baseline is 2010 to 2011, and as you can see, there's been a little dip or decrease in 2014, but after that, the line appears to be increasing again. We missed our 2013 goal, and it doesn't appear we're anywhere on track to meet the 2020 goal of a 50% reduction. If you look at Kentucky, we're an outlier. We have the second highest rate of MRSA in the bloodstream infections in the nation. Uh, and this has been multiple years. Uh, one year we were highest, some years were maybe third, but we were always in the, in the top echelon of states. There have been two basic strategies to control MRSA. The first has been surveillance and isolation. Uh, this has been adopted nationwide uh, by, in the United Kingdom. And the other is unit-wide daily chlorhexidine bathing. Uh, this protocol was uh, popularized by a study called the Reduced MRSA Study, and it's currently been adopted by many facilities in the United States. Now, I feel the Reduced MRSA Study has uh, some significant problems with research integrity, both in identifying the type of metrics that they felt were the most important, the spinning of data, the changing of metrics, and in not reporting of data. Uh, but yet this study has formed to a large part the basis of our infectious disease policy. Uh, so much so that ARC, uh, just a few months later, uh, produced a monograph guiding facilities on this study's implementation. Well, first, we'll talk about which metric is most important. A metric is, is a measure. Uh, the primary outcome of this study was hospital-associated MRSA burden, and it, it was uh, primarily measured by MRSA clinical cultures. But what you really wanted to know is, what's the infection rate? And the infection rate was a secondary outcome. The secondary outcome did not reach significance. The primary outcome did. 
the, the reason uh, that was oftentimes argued over this is that, well, uh, you know, our N wasn't big enough. Well, the other reason could be is that, uh, it, you know, it just wasn't significant. It, it didn't, uh, it doesn't work. And this was a very large study. It comprised 160 hospitals. So we're not talking about a small study. So the N, uh, if it's not big enough in that study, it would really be hard to have one uh, that it would be big enough unless it was a, a nationwide study. Now let's talk about spinning. And this, of course, is kind of in the eye of the beholder. Uh, but I, th I think that there are two major places of spinning in the abstract. The first is where the abstract reads that MRSA screening and isolation were implemented in group one. Now, each group had a intervention arm, and uh, they also had a uh, baseline or, or control arm. But in actuality, in both the baseline and the implementation group, in group one, the same thing took place, the same intervention. They had screening and isolation. And so it led one to the conclusion, because group one showed no change, uh, that screening isolation was ineffective, but yet it really wasn't evaluated in itself. In fact, group one was used to control secular trends to see if there was a change over time for the other groups. It wasn't used as a uh, test in itself of screening and isolation. In another area, it was at the end of the abstract, where it concluded in routine ICU practice, universal decolonization was more effective than targeted decolonization or screening and isolation and reducing rates of MRSA, clinical isolates, and bloodstream infections from any pathogen. That's a pretty profound statement, because to me, I, I, when I read that, I, I take that any pathogen means it reduces everything. Well, um, the data really didn't reflect that. The any pathogen was actually a metric that was labeled all pathogen and it involved a conglomerate metric of a group of bacteria, and the main bacteria that was decreased was commensal bacteria, which is similar to Stap F epi. Those are the more benign bacteria. Thus, any pathogen didn't mean all pathogens, but the name of the metric uh, in which all of these bacteria were grouped together. Again, that was confusing. Now, this is a confusing slide, or I, I guess a busy slide, but this shows us changes in metrics. Uh, September 2009, the study was filed with clinicaltrials.gov. 2011, in September, was the study's primary completion date and the study's completion date. In March 6th, a task order was filed with AHRQ to outline metrics that were going to be measured including central line infections, bloodstream infections, nosocomial bloodstream infections, which would be bacteria acquired in the hospital that cause infections, and urine infections. Well, in 2012, on clinicaltrials.gov in June, a uh, little over two months later, they eliminated the metric for the urinary tract infections, which was the urinary culture metric, was how it was described, eliminated the central line infection, the CLABSI metric, and added, this is after the study completion date, the all pathogen bloodstream me metric. So that, that metric was actually added after trial completion. And of course, that was a secondary outcome that obtained the clinical significance. This study was published in May 2013. In October 2013, we had a commentary published which outlined a lot of these metric changes. Well, nine days later, clinicaltrials.gov, this is after our study was published, nine days later, clinicaltrials.gov had another amendment. Uh, the explanation for CLABSI elimination was uh, given uh, because they had difficulty in standardizing the denominator for this measure. Um, I, I kind of was surprised at that because, you know, central line infections is a very common metric to be measured. One of the first ones, it's what we've had a 50% reduction in. That is the infection where we actually met our, our goal. 
uh, but nevertheless, uh, that, that took place. They added uh, back a urinary tract infection metric, added a metric for uh, emergence, the emergence of resistance to mucipyrocene or chlorhexidine, in other words, bacterial resistance, that's important, and added a blood culture contamination metric. I believe there was also a, a, a cost metric that was, that was added back. And in July 7th, 2014, uh, the explanation for CLABSI elimination was eliminated. So I'm not sure why it was eliminated. So at any rate, that, that study, I would say, had multiple changes in metrics or measuring things. And of course, any time you change things after the facts, you're changing the rule of the game. You don't want to, in research, take second looks, take multiple looks. Uh, anything, when you do that, can affect the reliability of, of the test and, and of the study. Now, delayed reporting of data. I think the most important here is that the resistance to mucipyrocene and chlorhexidine has not been reported. Uh, it's still not reported. Uh, the original um, uh, due date was March 2015. That was then changed to October 2016. And as of a few days ago, when I checked, uh, there's still no results reported. Well, why is this important? Well, we heard about in the last lecture about resistance to cholestin. Well, there's a new study out, antimicrobial agents in chemotherapy, uh, which implicates chlorhexidine in causing resistance to cholestin. Remember, that's the last line antibiotic. And it does this through induction of um, efflux pumps. And, and these, these pumps can pump out multiple antibiotics. It's kind of like a sinking ship. And you get the water pumps that just start pumping out water. Well, it'll pump out oil, gasoline, it, doesn't, it just starts pumping out stuff. And well, one of the things that this can uh, pump out is cholestin. Uh, this also confirms a previous study back in 2012, which also implicated chlorhexidine in uh, producing these efflux pumps, and that postulated that it indeed may well give the bacteria uh, of CRE a selective advantage and be part of the uh, epidemic or reason for the epidemic in Europe. Europe, by the way, uh, this is not as popular as in the United States. Europe, some countries do the screening in isolation for bacteria. The other thing which I th was somewhat disappointed in is, is the delay in the urinary tract reporting. This was uh, due June of 2015. It was published in The Lancet in December of 2015. And really, a, a 2015 report, uh, a time period for this important metric when a study was completed several years prior, to me is, is pretty delayed. And uh, essentially, there was no good clinical efficacy. And you really wouldn't expect there to be, because chlorhexidine can be pretty rough on mucosa, perineal areas, very tough to sterilize. And so it did not have. Uh, a clinical, clinical effect in that area. And finally, invalid methodology. Now, this is, is not in the um, reduced MRSA study itself, but uh, a few of the authors uh, are uh, involved or were involved in some publications uh, or presentations uh, that involved determining resistance using MIC testing. Now, MIC testing is uh, the mean inhibitory concentration. It tests for inhibition of bacteria. The bacteria doesn't grow. The bacteria could be killed, but it could be asleep. Well, in the body, if the bacteria is either killed or asleep, if it's killed, it's killed. If it's asleep, you've got white blood cells and antibodies to then kill it. Now, being put to sleep isn't as good as being killed, but it's, it's not bad. On the skin surface, that doesn't count. You don't have any white blood cells or antibodies to kill the bacteria. If the bacteria is put to sleep on the surface, when the antiseptic dissipates, it can reemerge. The bacteria can reemerge. And so that uh, MIC testing to determine resistance to a, or to determine susceptibility to an antiseptic is really not a good test to do. Uh, it's not always valid. And indeed, there have been a number of studies which have shown uh, questionable differences between the MIC test versus 
uh, doing the genetic test for the resistant genes. So, and also in the article, um, it was noted that, uh, and this was uh, the article, and I can't pronounce the name, but it's a, a prastic, uh, noted that a susceptibility to uh, chlorhexidine uh, may be a contributing factor in the chlorhexidine-resistant bacteria were observed independent of MICs. So, uh, you know, you can have a bacteria that looks like it's not growing on MIC, but it's still resistant to chlorhexidine. And so that, that is a problem. Uh, and it's a problem, again, with research uh, integrity. Uh, so this is a, a short talk. I, I just went over some of the things that you will find in articles. And believe me, this is not uncommon. Uh, you will find uh, uh, multiple reports, multiple trials, uh, doing a study multiple times and just reporting what's significant. Remember, if the significance is one chance in 20, if you look at something 20 times, you're bound to get one to be significant. And if you just publish that, you have a publication, but you really don't have a significance. All right, thank you.